So welcome everybody um, and welcome to Laura Mezzanotte, the speaker of today. Um, she's a group leader um, at the Erasmus Medical Center. Um, she joined uh, a few years ago uh, as assistant professor um, after uh, postdoc in Leiden and uh, studies including PhD at the University of Bologna. And today she's going to tell us something about uh, nanoparticles um, uh, for uh, contra MRI contrast agents. So Laura, the, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Laura, from Laura to Laura. Um, so um, how can we advance MRI using nanoparticle-based uh, contrast agents and why we should do that? Um, first, I have nothing to disclose, apart the fact that I'm not a chemist, so my presentation will be full of errors, so don't, don't, don't care about it. Um, because um, I'm originally from Rimini, which is a fantastic place on the beach. Uh, we go to the beach every summer and we still walk on a very old uh, uh, Roman uh, Empire bridge. Uh, we also drive on it and still uh, um, works. Uh, but I studied in Bologna because Rimini is not a city uh, for science, I must say. Uh, I studied in Bologna. I did uh, biotechnology and then I did a PhD in uh, chemistry. Uh, in analytical chemistry. If you are wondering about the map, this is a wine map. So I'm born and raised in a, in a region where we do drink Sangiovese. So I still drink Sangiovese. And if you should know a chemist from Bologna, probably you know Professor Balzani, Vincenzo Balzani, which is a very famous uh, photochemist, but also one uh, of uh, the founder uh, of the study on molecular machines mm, together with Stoddart and Seringa. So uh, just to continue, uh, welcome and how do you feel today? So let's use a little of interaction. You can go to the annotate function in your uh, Zoom, which is in uh, view options, annotate. And then if you can put a stamp or a, a cross or whatever, a drawing and let me know how do you feel this afternoon. Yeah. Oh, good. Tired. Okay. It's four o'clock. Okay. Two person can find the annotate function. The other cannot find the annotate function. <laughs> okay. That's good. Let's continue. Let's. Uh, oh, okay. Mm. Okay. Tired. Quite energetic. Okay. Okay. I'm uh, happy to see that we are uh, uh, especially like a Gaussian, so really in the middle, we can continue. So because what I'm going to talk about is a little bit, how can you use MRI imaging in clinic and preclinic and three different type of nanoparticles hmm, that are used for MRI imaging. So uh, some are based on gadolinium, so they are nano gadolinium. Uh, some are um, targeted. PLGA nanoparticle uh, with uh, containing perfluorocarbons. So they allow 19F MRI imaging. And finally, I give you a little presentation of a new technology, which is magnetic particle imaging, which is based on iron oxide nanoparticle, but uh, is uh, different from uh, uh, standard uh, MRI imaging and open up new avenues uh, uh, for the future. Uh, as you, as you probably know, uh, in vivo molecular imaging is, uh, uh, can be done with many different techniques. Uh, all, uh, uh, all my PhD was based on luminescence-based methods. So most of the times I was working with fluorescence or bioluminescence or electrochemiluminescence and so on. Uh, but uh, today we speak about MRI, which does not use visible light, of course, but use a, a radio frequency. Hmm? And, um, which is the principle, let's say if you do a standard hydrogen um, MRI, so the hydrogen nuclei uh, behaves like a compass needle, uh, that um, the compass needles can be uh, partially aligned by a strong magnetic field hmm, in the scanner. So like uh, if you have uh, this nuclei, the nuclei can be rotated using uh, a radio wave. So that's why we use uh, radio waves can uh, rotate the nuclei and then the nuclei oscillates huh? uh, and while uh, their magnetization returns to equilibrium 
they also emit a radio signal. So this radio signal uh, of, the, uh, of the nuclei that uh, returns uh, to the original states is uh, detected by a coil, an antenna, uh, by a coil uh, in, the, um, in the scanner. And in this way, with this signal, the image is, uh, is created, is uh, reconstructed, actually. So what are the advantages of MRI is that you have a high spatial resolution. Uh, in preclinical, we can go down to 100 micromolar, 25. In clinically, mostly is one millimolar. You don't have tissue penetration limits because uh, uh, it's not like light that is absorbed and scattered. You don't use ionizing radiation. That's the typical one that you use when you do PET, uh, positron emission thermography, or nuclear medicine, X-ray, and so on. The downside is that most of the imaging uh, contrast agents have low sensitivity. So we are speaking about millimolar ranges of uh, contrast agents. Why, when we do, for example, um, FDG PET, we inject a nano, uh, nanomolar huh? or picomolar. And of course, it's a technology which has a high cost. Hmm? And it's a long scanning time. But, but uh, it gives you nicely uh, detailed anatomical images. Huh? That's why it can be ideally combined with other molecular imaging techniques, like for example, for me it was always the optical, because with bioluminescence, huh, I do image the light in the animals, I'm speaking preclinically. It's a method which is cheap, simple, and I throughput, but of course it's light. So we get this uh, fantastic uh, scatter because we detect the light on the super on the surface. Huh? And if the signal comes from uh, depth in the body, then the photon scatters and they create this blurred, uh, uh, not crisp uh, <laughs> signal. While with magnetic resonance, we really can appreciate, especially using contrast, uh, very small detail in the image. So, um, but what has been done in the clinic until now, uh, at least my department, 35% of all clinical MRI scans are uh, done using approved uh, gadolinium-based uh, contrast agents, which are injected intravenously. Uh, the gadolinium is a typical T1 contrast agent, and gadolinium uh, gives uh, concerns, uh, has always given some concern because it's not a specific uh, uh, contrast agent, can give some nephrotoxicity, and of course, uh, uh, as a rapid renal clearance, clearance and you, it takes long to acquire images in the patients. On top of that, like in 2014, 2015, uh, McDonald other uh, re reported that gadolinium can uh, can accumulate. Huh? Uh, they found the deposition of gadolinium in, in the brain hmm? after repeated uh, intravenous administra administration of uh, gadolinium contrast agents, and um, after some years, then finally, uh, FDA in 2017 uh, starts requiring a new class warming for uh, gadolinium contrast agents. So uh, new animal and human studies are needed to really uh, find out what is really happening, because uh, scientists are still debating how toxic or non-toxic it is, how much it is. And of course, they increase the pharmacovigilance. This open up uh, uh, the field that many other people start to produce new contrast agents eh, to partially replace gadolinium or, or ameliorate gadolinium. So then we can inject a less dose. So uh, the other contrast agents, uh, apart of gadolinium, you can have uh, T2 contrast uh, agents, which are mostly iron oxide uh, and particles, uh, 19F, which, uh, for example, perfluorocarbons, I'm going to speak in a bit. You can have hyperpolarized uh, uh, contrast agents. One example is uh, uh, carbonium-13 uh, uh, pyruvate, which, for example, in neuroradiology is very important because it gives you um, insights on uh, uh, metabolism. And, uh, and then CEST uh, or paracest contrast agents, um, chemical exchange, uh, uh, contrast agents. One example is LRP protein. So for example, uh, some group overexpressed LRP protein in the neurons 
and this protein uh, can give uh, rise uh, to this phenomenon and then uh, cest uh, imaging uh, can be done. Uh, quite complicated to me, but uh, in some application are very cool. Um, so that's uh, the people who are um, tightly working, collaborating with me. So I have uh, two PhD students. One is Georgia, which is uh, developing uh, this uh, PLJ nanoparticle for uh, targeted, targeted particle to uh, image uh, tumor-associated macrophages. Natasha is helping on that. And then I had uh, two visiting PhD students, both from Italy, where my collaborators are. Uh, I have C1. Uh, C1 is a pharmaceutical chemist, so C1 can conjugate uh, and produce a lot of PLJ particles. Uh, we can uh, design uh, many different combinations. And then I had Angela. Angela comes from uh, the lab of Enza Torino at the Italian Institute of Technology. She is a, a trained chemical engineer. So she does uh, all the synthesis of nanoparticle and macrofluidics and design all different conjugation strategies. So the first type of particle I'm going to talk about are these chunks. So cross-linked hyaluronic acid nanoparticle containing gadolinium chelates. How are they done? So these are done uh, and published uh, uh, this year, but also some years ago, the first attempt uh, by ENTA. Uh, what do they do? They have this uh, microfluidic uh, um, using uh, hydrodynamic flow focusing. Hmm? That's what they use. So what they do, they just add all the regions in the channel and then uh, in the microfluidic chamber nanoprecipitation occurs and and the nanoparticle are formed so for example here in this image you can see that uh, they add the uh, hyaluronic acid with the peg crosslinker the gadolinium based contrast agent and also a fluorescent dye and so the fluorescent dye and the gadolinium get entrapped in this uh, hyaluronic acid based uh, nanoparticle um, this is another image uh, also from the paper that that's what you can see at the microscope uh, uh, what's happening in the in the chamber and uh, you have a cool chamber and then in the other channel the nano precipitation of course as you can see in uh, figure b and on the on the c part of the image you can see the reaction so what happens uh, the cross linking of uh, hyaluronic acid and, and peg that is directly happening inside uh, the microfluidic channel um, and then they realize that something uh, nice happens to gadolinium when they produce this type of particle. So when gadolinium is encapsulated in these polymeric networks, uh, they write a complex equilibrium is formed by elastic stretches of polymer chains, water osmotic pressure, and the hydration degree of gadolinium contrast agent. And this effect is able to boost the relaxivity of gadolinium based contrast agents and the relaxivity is important so it's uh, what uh, determines uh, um, the, man the magnetic signal in in uh, in imaging they call this effect hydrodendricity okay and the ability of hydrodendricity to boost uh, this relaxometric pro properties of gadolinium improved mri performances so what they calculated is that uh, since they get 10 times higher contrast with the same dose of gadolinium, they can reduce the amount of gadolinium injected in patients because with 10 times less, they, they do uh, the same um, contrast. And then in a further paper, they try to explain why this happens uh, in the structure. So if you, if you look at, at the image uh, on the bottom, you see that if you only have hyaluronic acid with water, that type of uh, uh, open uh, uh, flat uh, structure are formed. While if they had the gadolinium already, um, it's quite inhomogeneous uh, structure and the water is uh, sparse. But when they add also the cross linker, uh, more water gets entrapped. And, and this changes the uh, relaxivity uh, values. And it depends really on the proportion. So, for example, they measure the, the relaxivity here, and then you can see that if they have. 0.25% of gadolinium loaded in, in the particle, that's when they get the highest uh, um, relaxivity value compared to free gadolinium. And that's where they say it is a 10 times different in, in, in relaxivity. So based on this, they start to design this particle with different conjugation um, 
methods. So then they could conjugate peptides or other molecules to the surface uh, of the of the hyaluronic acid and design some targeted uh, contrast agents. So what Angela did uh, in my lab in the microfluidic chamber, um, they had this idea. So they put angiopep2. Angiopep2 is a peptide which uh, link to LRP1 protein, so the protein I was talking about before, which is expressed in, uh, in neurons um, in the brain. And then they say, if we encapsulate together with gadolinium also the irinotecan, which is a, a drug, um, we can do what is called a teranostic. Hmm? So then we can use this particle both for imaging, but also to deliver the therapy. Hmm? And for now, uh, the um, preliminary data we have, this is just a fax analysis, because of course, for the particle we produce in the lab, as I was showing you before, we also have put a uh, fluorescent dye, which is a uh, fluorescein. Uh, <laughs> and we went to sort the cells after they have uptaken the particle. What was uh, really good is that, that instead of working with uh, classical uh, glioblastoma cell lines, we had access to these uh, um, patient-derived xenograft cell lines. So that our um, glioblastoma cells uh, cell line created from patient's uh, tumor. And we got access to this because of course we collaborate with neurosurgery and they have all this library of cell lines that they usually use to screen drugs to treat glioblastoma. And what we can, you can see here is that if you have targeted uh, chumps with angiopep and then you wait for uptake in this uh, type of cells and you measure the fluorescent signal so the fluorescent signal um, of the angiopep it's higher after a certain time so this sort of targeting is uh, helping the uptake of the particle um, second type of particle i'm gonna talk to you about is um, plj hmm? targeted PLJ for detection of uh, tumor-associated macrophage. Why 19F? Okay, 90F is a promising uh, moiety because as uh, same sensitivity more or less of proton MRI, uh, but you don't have background signal because there is no 19F uh, in the body. And, uh, and so you can have a selective and specific assessment of uh, the compounds containing 19F in vivo. Huh? What you get, you, are, you get these images of where the 19F is uh, located uh, in, uh, and then you can combine with the uh, hydrogen uh, uh, MRI. So uh, why tumor associated macrophages? They are very important because they promote tumor progression. So in the last years, uh, many therapies started to um, to be proposed uh, to eliminate tumor associated macrophages just uh, to help other therapy to work better. Mm? Like, for example, if you do a standard checkpoint inhibitor uh, immunotherapy, this can be further enhanced if you eliminate the myeloid derived cells. And there are many different types of uh, macrophages uh, in the tumor. What I want to highlight here, that the one you find the most in the tumor stroma, so surrounding the yes, solid tumors, are this uh, blue one here in the image, which have high expression of this marker. One of them is called the MANOS receptor uh, one. So it's really highly expressed. So if you uh, design a particle that target that is manosylated, so it targets the manos receptor, you can expect to have higher increase in the macrophages. Considering that also macrophages are phagocytic cells, so they are the perfect target for nanoparticle because they accumulate there a lot. Um, so that's what we design. So we designed this uh, PLJ, which is also conjugated to Fitch. Mm -hmm. uh, the one conjugated with to Fitch we mostly use for preclinical, but of course in clinic you don't do that. And then PEG, mm -hmm. you need uh, to add PEG to escape a re uh, rest, so a, re a reticular endothelial system, and get your particle to circulate longer in, um, in, uh, in vivo. And then we put a manose ligand, 
and then inside we encapsulated uh, per fluorocarbon. So per fluorocarbon is that compound you see there with all that uh, uh, fluoro atoms. Uh, it's a crown ether. And this we produce not in microfluidic. With this we produced uh, on the bench, old style. Uh, the difficulty here is that uh, PFC is that type of compound that is soluble in nothing. So we have to homogenize uh, uh, PFC um, uh, before, huh? and then we do an organic phase uh, uh, with PFC and the, uh, and the PLGA. And then we do a water phase containing polyvinyl alcohol, 1%. And then little by little, we add the organic phase to the water phase and we do magnetic steering. And then we do ultra centrifugation to purify it. And then later we also do freeze drying to uh, really uh, purify them better. And then uh, we get this nice uh, round particle hmm, that we analyzed uh, at 10. And we produce a different type of. Huh? So in the studies, we did, uh, for example, a standard PLJ with perfluorocarbon, pegylated ones, and then the one targeting and non targeting uh, um, mannose, the one with the mannose and not mannose. And then we characterize them by at the zeta sizer, so with dynamic light scattering. So we determine the diameter, uh, the polydispersity index, and the zeta potential. The zeta potential is very, very uh, important to measure, in my opinion, because it, it should be quite negative. Because if it is positive, you can get uh, some toxicity, cardiotoxicity, depending on, on the size of the particle, but also they end up in the rest. So they get, uh, they, uh, get eliminated uh, quicker. Uh, so here are, are negative. And since they are very big, as you can see, uh, these uh, are around the 300 nanometers. So uh, they mostly accumulate in the tumor thanks to EPR effect that is uh, Enhanced permeability retention, but then after accumulating there, they are retained because then the macrophages will uh, uptake them and keep them there. Uh, what we have done, uh, we measured at, uh, at NMR the presence of uh, 19F. And, and then you can see uh, there in a nice graph, we see it. So it's there, we see the peak. And thanks to this, we could quantify uh, also the encapsulation efficiency that was around 30-60%. And this is very important because if you don't encapsulate enough uh, contrast agent, then you have to inject a super big amount of particle, which are the polymer. You have a limit that you can inject in animals. Huh? So you have to do the, the highest amount possible of your contrast agent in, in, in the polymer that you have. Then we tested rapidly uh, toxicity. We really had it in super amount. So we had one uh, milligram uh, ml and higher. Uh, this does not correspond to what you do in vivo because in vivo in animals, you inject um, maximum five milligram of polymer to the whole animal. Uh, so uh, we injected to macrophages to see if they really die about it, but it was not the, the case. And then we did, um, something uh, uh, to test uh, their specificity. So macrophages usually uh, have a different uh, uh, activations stage status in, um, in, um, in a physiological environment. So uh, they can be inflammatory macrophages. Huh? We call them M2, M1-like, or they can be non-inflammatory macrophages, the one who help tissue remodeling, and that they are the one also that are promoting tumor growth. These are M2-like. So these uh, M2-like macrophages, which are the one you find in the stroma, which I was telling you before, express mannose receptor. Hmm? So what we do here, we take normal macrophages, which are uh, M0, huh? uh, raw macrophages, and we polarize them in one sense or the other, by culturing them with different cytokines. So if you culture them with uh, IL-4, they uh, phenotypically shift to M2-like. If you culture them with uh, interferon gamma LPS, they become uh, inflammatory macrophages. And what is quite clear from this graph is that when you have mannose, they get more uptaken. Hmm? With or without PEG, 
they get higher uptake in M2 uh, like macrophages. And to show this, uh, here you see that our particle also have Fitch. So we could see Fitch uh, uh, in the microscope. And then you can see uh, in the lower image that the nanoparticles are, uh, are uh, in the cytosol, not in the nuclei. So the nuclei looks like a, a less bright. And then uh, you, we stain the membrane with this uh, red mm, to, to show uh, where the membrane is. And then the particles are inside and not attached to the membrane. Then we wanted to move in vivo finally. Uh, so uh, how can we quantify uh, 19F? So what you do, you usually create a standard curve like in any methods. So you take your perfluorocarbon different uh, um, amount uh, and then you uh, get the MRS signal, you build your standard curve and then you take your nanoparticle, you measure the value of your nanoparticle and you interpolate into the curve you have built. So for um, average um, of, of uh, our uh, preparations, we get sort of like 7.7, uh, 7, 10 uh, elevated uh, to the 22nd of uh, 19F atoms uh, in one uh, uh, milligram. Mm -hmm. So this we know based on literature that it is enough signal to be seen in vivo. Then, you know, 19F MRI needs a special coil. It's not the standard hydrogen coil to, to detect uh, the signal. Um, and the coil uh, broke while we were doing, uh, before we were starting the experiment. So we had the animal, so we had to take all the tumor and we decided to do an ex vivo analysis. So we could not image the mice, but we could measure the amount of uh, uh, 19F in the tumors after we isolated them with the uh, NX vivo methods. So what you can see here is that we have a standard that is uh, 5FC in, uh, in homogenized uh, tumor tissue. And, and then what we could see that if you have tumor sample from a uh, functionalized nanoparticle, you have a, a PFC signal peak around 10. While if you have a tumor sample from uh, um, from animals that were treated with the nanoparticles, no man knows, so non functionalized particle, then we get a much lower PFC signal. And for us, this was an indication we need to confirm further with finally the in vivo images that uh, our targeting helps the accumulation of the particle there. So that's a break. Do I have still five minutes? Okay. So the last things I want to talk to you about is magnetic particle imaging. So magnetic particle imaging uses iron oxide nanoparticles. And how it does it in this uh, new way, uh, I first uh, let uh, the experts speak. So there is this company called Magnetic Insight. They do produce the scanner because they have a special scanner to detect iron oxide uh, nanoparticle. Um, so I let him speak because he speaks very good with a very nice Canadian accent. Do you hear it, huh? No, damn it. Okay, then I have to talk. <laughs> so I go to the other one. Uh, that's bad. Good. Okay, so uh, I go one up. Yeah, so magnetic particle imaging is a new molecular imaging technique. Huh? So it's a tracer. So as I said, it um, uses a super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticle, um, can do two projection images, but can do also 3D uh, tomography. I will show you how. And uh, preclinical system are available, but they are currently developing the clinical scanner. So that's why I'm thinking that in the future, we will see more and more about it. Uh, how, how does it work? So if you have a normal magnetic resonance imaging, you have a uniform field. Uh, magnetic field, uh, which is the famous B0, and it can be the 7 Tesla MRI, the 11 Tesla M MRI with weak gradients, and you image across the magnetic field. With this scanner, instead, you have a gradient field, and you have a strong gradient, mm? and you don't image where the gradient is, but you image in the middle, in the field-free region. So it's a different uh, type of imaging. 
And while you raster scan the, the, the animal in the scanner, then you can, can create the 2D projection. But then since they manage to have a rotation of the gantry, they could reconstruct, huh? uh, they could do tomography. So detect the signal at every angle. And that's the type of images that you get. So you get the image of uh, um, the magnetic uh, resonance um, contrast agent. And then of course, usually they superimpose it to a CT. In this case, it's a CT or, um, or a, a, another uh, magnetic resonance to see the exact location of the signal. Okay, so th this is a combination of two images. And what is nice about this uh, is that actually it works with a lot of already available tracers. Hmm? Uh, magnetic particles have been used in clinic. Uh, uh, we have actually two types of particle uh, clinical proof, like ferrumoxytol uh, um, and uh, magtrace, so ferrocarbotron. And also in preclinical, we have uh, many different superparagnetic iron oxide particles. The common, the common uh, feature of this particle is that all of them are non-targeted. So they are just uh, uh, in different formulation with dextran or other excipients. So I think that there is um, a lot of space to create new contrast agents for nanoparticle based imaging uh, by adding uh, targeting or um, to what it is already existing. Um, I'm showing you some application just to show you the, 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 what you can do nice with magnetic particle imaging. For example, here uh, in this paper, they um, monitor the drug release. So again, they did simply PLGA with DOXO, very common uh, preparation. But of course, they encapsulated also uh, the um, ferromoxid uh, nanoparticle in it. And what happens is that when uh, ferromoxide is encapsulated, you have a low MPI signal because the, the iron is it's inside. And then when, of course, PLJ um, degraded and let the drugs out, um, release the drug, but they also release the particle. And this creates a high MPI signal. So for example, in this experiment, you see they injected uh, this uh, contrast agent, this teranostic agent, and they could see during the hours the signal uh, accumulating uh, because of uh, the drug release. And I'm sure they did also the control in which uh, uh, <laughs> they, um, they just see uh, iron oxide. Um, and um, another thing that you can do is that uh, you can do also hyperthermia because since you have iron oxide, you can use the radio frequency energy um, to to create energy and to heat up the particle. Hmm? And the moment you can heat up, so what they do, they have an extra um, an, an extra um, coil by which they can heat the, the particle. Um, and, and why do you want to heat the particle? Because this can do a lot of therapy. So we usually have hyperthermia just in adjunction to normal therapy like uh, um, chemotherapy or immunotherapy or radiation therapy, then you can do also thermotherapy. Of course, if you have a drug uh, that uh, can be released only by heat uh, and also for doing uh, tissue ablation in many application of tissue ablation. Um, and that's, that's how it works. So in their opinion, then you have to uh, deliver the particle, do imaging and quantify where they are when you know where they are, if they are, have accumulated to the target uh, tissue that you want to target. So then you do this precise magnetic uh, uh, radio frequency heating uh, alone or in combination with the other therapy. And, um, and then you can do both. So you can do the heating and then you can do the imaging with the, with the different uh, frequency. So I think uh, this also open up uh, a lot of new opportunities in the uh, magnetic field. And then I'm a little out of time, but it's fine. So I, I end up here and I thank you all uh, people I collaborate. As you can see, they are a lot, especially uh, in my department in which I have uh, Prof. Lowy, Krant and Mark, Immunology, 
because you need to know about macrophages, neurosurgery for glioma application, and especially also experimental surgical oncology because they have all the instrument to characterize nanoparticles that otherwise we don't have in, uh, in Erasmus Medical Center. The animal imaging uh, facility where we do all the MRI images, um, and then my collaborator in Italy, which is uh, University of Camerino. So uh, Dr. Piera Di Martino, which is uh, associate professor and, and PLGA expert, and, and then Institute, uh, Italian Institute of Technology, so ENFA for the CHAMPS, and then the other uh, company uh, on which I, we have grants, uh, especially um, Marie Curie ITN grants. So then we share PhD students on these topics. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Laura.